Good day, it's Christoph Oosthuizen here. I'm your host for this webinar in the Practitioner Webinar Series brought to you by CEDA, IBASA and the Entrepreneurial Planning Institute. And I'm very happy to introduce to you today our guest Gary Graham, the Chief Reinvention Officer of Three Eyes Group. He'll be introducing us to ideas around reinvention. And the theme, of course, is reinvent to grow. So in this time of rapid change, what we as practitioners, supporting entrepreneurs, or as business owners ourselves can do to increase the impact and create ways for us to respond to the fast changing world. So without uh, any more delay, over to you, Gary. To April 1912, it's a, a clear night, clear skies. The um, two men that had just come on duty in the lookout, that's uh, uh, perched high in the crow's nest above the ship, above the Titanic. Uh, they were perfectly sober. And we mentioned this quite deliberately because there was a massive jaw. There was a massive party on board. Yeah. Um, a massive party on board uh, because it was the ship's maiden voyage, this Titanic. Um, but some interesting things about this story, which many of us may not know, uh, and three things we just want to point them out one by one. Number one, these two gentlemen that came on duty in the crow's nest had no binoculars. Can you believe it? A basic tool of the trade, no binoculars. Why not? Because the binoculars was locked up in a glass cabinet uh, on the ship. And the person with a key for the glass cabinet had disembarked to go and attend to some emergency. Now, based on what you know about the story of the Titanic, why did nobody bother to break the glass cabinet? Any thoughts? Why did nobody bother? Uh, pop a comment in the chat for us, please. Why did nobody bother to break the glass cap cabinet? Yeah, Henry, uh, maybe only to be used in emergencies. Yeah, nobody anticipated. Uh, but why didn't they? So that's a basic tool of trade. They come on duty. They know the, the binoculars is there, but it's locked away. Yeah, could be. Yeah, it could have been that they were afraid to disrupt. Uh, thank you, Estelle. It was a new ship. I mean, who? Who wants to break anything new? <laughs> you know, it got me thinking sometimes in our businesses when we start something, um, but because it's our baby, we know the thing is not working. Once when it done, I'll freak mark, you know, mark I done more, do it, kill it off. But we motor on because it's our baby, we're so attached to that outcome. You know, nobody wants to break anything new. But the prevailing view on the Titanic was uh, a bit of arrogance. The prevailing view was this ship is unsinkable. So why the heck are we going to need binoculars? You know, so for us in our businesses, as advisors, when we're advising our clients, where are we getting insights about potential disruptions that are coming? What are the sources that we're consulting? What can we do in our teams to get better uh, at anticipating timely warnings uh, before they hit us? So that's the first thing. Um, arrogance. Stop them from going to get that binoculars out. And by the way, one of the men actually survived the disaster. And he was asked later on, what would have helped you to avert this disaster? Guess what his answer was? A pair of binoculars. The second interesting thing in the story is they had the best radio operators, the best equipment in the world. Did you know they were getting messages from passing ships saying, Mensa, iceberg coming. Watch out. They got warning messages from passing ships, but the radio operator's response went something like the following. Get off this radio frequency because we are busy sending messages for the first class passengers. In actual fact, somebody shared with me recently, that's how they got paid. That's the only wages that they earned was what the first class passengers paid them to send their messages. 
Now, what do we call that? What do we call that? That is, a, is an inability to recognize that there's a new emerging reality happening. Um, that there's a new reality evolving and refusing. Well, Terence, not maybe, maybe, but that was their job. That was their job. We reckon in some cases, um, we think customer service is one of the things that actually sank the ship. Uh, you know, think about our business models of previous years, you know, where the customer is king. Yeah, they were perhaps focused on the wrong thing. But the essence of it was they, they failed, thank you, ignorance. Uh, they failed to recognize that there was a new and emerging reality. Uh, can, you, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Warning, ships are giving you warning messages saying there's a massive thing that's going to nail you. And you going, no, nah, it's all right, lost my, uh, not for me, you know. Iceberg for what? For whom? <laughs> uh, I know we have the benefit of hindsight and looking back, but yeah, think about how many times we do the same thing in our businesses with our clients. And then the last thing, uh, probably the most fascinating for me about the story is the first officer on duty was a gentleman called William Murdoch. Uh, he was considered the best in the world at averting disasters like this. A few years earlier, he had helped a similar ship avert, I think it called, called the Arabica, uh, avert a similar disaster. So what does Murdoch do? At the last minute, um, if you can see this, I don't know the correct nautical terms, but he gives instruction for the ship to turn uh, away from the iceberg, to avoid the iceberg like that, okay? Not like that, but like that, yeah? And what did that do? Well, that caused the iceberg to push up against the hull of the ship. It popped the rivets, which they found out later was substandard quality. It popped the rivets, pushed the hull in, and it took on water, but it damaged four or five compartments. Now, what the experts reckon is if Murdoch had just done this and gone rammed the ice, the ship straight into the iceberg, it would have been okay. You would have damaged one compartment, maybe two. But what did Murdoch do? Remember, he was considered the best in the world. He did what he did before. In other words, he applied best practice. And in this case, best practice was one of the things that actually sank the ship. He relied on best practice. He did what he always did. And it got me thinking about how many times, you know, past experiences, past successes serve us well in our businesses. But, but where may it be limiting our progress where we have this over-reliance on past successes? And so the, the, the tendency in the story is to blame the iceberg. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't the iceberg's fault. The iceberg was there uh, long before the ship arrived. And so in doing this work for the last uh, two to three years or so, you know, we initially started out by calling it a corporate disease, but we've subsequently found it around the world. Uh, we're part of a big practitioner community. I see one or two of them on this call as well, joining me today, uh, like Phil, I'll, uh, hi Phil. Um, we're not just finding it in corporates and organizations, but we're finding it in small businesses, family-owned businesses, startups, uh, big listed companies, communities, whole governments, whole countries. What is that disease? It's when we're facing disruption, we create our own downfall through the presence of these three things, arrogance and excessive attachment to the past and an, over, uh, an inability to recognize a new and emerging reality. So I want you to think about that for a minute. You know, just pause. Just let this, if there's nothing else you take away from today, please take this slide. Where are you noticing aspects of Titanic syndrome? Uh, either, either all three of them or one of the three. Arrogance, an excessive attachment to the past or an inability to recognize a new and emerging reality. I'd, I'd love to hear from you, please, in the chat. Where are you noticing 
aspects of the Titanic syndrome. And, and we've got plenty of examples, but I'd love to hear from you. Uh, please pop a comment in a chat. Uh, you can think of institutions, you can think of organizations, you can think of businesses. Uh, Gary, you've, you've got the option to draw anyone in to talk as well, if, if chat fantastic, is not sufficient. Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks, uh, Christoph, appreciate that. So, uh, but I'm keen to hear from uh, participants, where are you noticing aspects of Titanic syndrome? Uh, I'm going to give you one, uh, the SA post office in our country. And please, this is with respect to any of you who have family working in the post office. But man, I don't know when last you've been into one, but it's a not, not a nice place to walk into as a consumer. But I don't blame the people, I blame the leadership, you know. Uh, so what did the post office try and do? You know, there's a law in this country that prevents the um, transport, I think, of packages under a kilo or two kilos. I can't remember the exact number. It's always been there, but it's never been enforced. And um, what did the post office try and do last year? Uh, try to get that law enforced, which would make it illegal for the courier companies to do the work that they do. And I started wondering, well, you know, my bank card, when that credit card expires, when the heck am I going to get that card if the post office is delivering it? Yeah. Uh, Nokia, Kodak, killed by its own technologies. Uh, aspects of our government, uh, state-owned entities, political parties. You know, when somebody says to you, uh, we're going to rule till Jesus comes. It's exceptional arrogance. And by the way, please don't, don't kill me if you're a fan of that political party, but I can point them all out, every single one of them. We see aspects of arrogance and excessive attachment to the past and inability to recognize a new and emerging reality. The way that elections are run uh, is stuck in the past. Uh, the way that many uh, um, uh, local community structures are set up, I uh, thank you to be so, has aspects of this. So now what I want you to think about as you're pointing out these examples, thank you, Mercy, for, and thank you others for all of those examples. Where do you notice aspects of the Titanic syndrome in yourself? in your own business, if you're a business here today? Where are you noticing aspects of the Titanic syndrome if you're a, an advisor, a business advisor? Do you sometimes see a bit of arrogance keep creeping in? You know, like I know myself does niks meer wat jylle vir my kan leer nie. Uh, you know, or are we sometimes excessively attached to our past solutions and hoping that that's it got us here, so now it's going to get us there with our clients. Um, or do we do we not recognize that there's a new and emerging reality emerging? Where are you noticing it with yourself? Because the reality is, um, uh, Guy, that is a very interesting comment. Can you just unmute and give us a little bit more on that, please? So Guy who, would you like to, who, who would you like to hear from, uh, Gary? Uh, Guy Harris. Okay, Guy. Uh, I think he dropped off now. One of these. Guy will allow you to speak. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I dropped off from my unstable device or the unstable person. I apologize if it's me. But I find that I have problems with my laptop, but not on my phone. So you've got a very poor... Uh, um, uh, thing on my phone. Um, yeah, there's a big difference between management of the crisis and crisis management. I learned that when I was in Durban in the floods in 1987, where Mondi did management of the crisis and everyone else did crisis management. So they were running around in ever decreasing circles trying to say, what do we do now? What do we do now? Where's the divine help going to come from? Um, and whereas Mondi, the first thing they did was to go out and buy every single pair of gumboots um, that was available in the shops. The um, second thing that they did was that they um, did, sorry, I've done a presentation on this before. If somebody, if anybody wants it, email me and I will, I will it's, it's a low key presentation. 
uh, but I'm happy to share it because we need to get away from crisis management as South Africans to management of the crisis. I mean, I, I wonder whether our sevens team at the moment is not perhaps involved in crisis management rather than management of the crisis. So, so Mondi, yeah, yeah, hopefully not. Yeah, Mondi, were the first. It was at that stage the 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 second biggest uh, insurance claim in South Africa's history. The only one that was bigger was a Sassel one, um, and we got that paid out. I, I was a consultant working for Deloitte at that stage, and we got that paid out within record time. Um, and because the leadership of Mondi, and let me not take credit for their leadership, they were really, really good at management of the crisis rather than Excellent. crisis management. So thank okay. you for that example. And I think this aspect of crisis management, uh, you'll see in, in uh, a model or framework that I share with you in a minute. Thank you for the examples coming through. Uh, Tandeka Aubrey, thank you. Uh, Mongadi, yeah. Great to reflect on where we're seeing this with ourselves, yeah? So the reality is, folks, that icebergs are coming. Uh, COVID is not the last of our disruption. You know, we've got a Ebola outbreak in Central Africa last year. Uh, we've seen the impact of, for example, the floods now, uh, the looting previously in KZN, the disruption in the ports with Transnet. More icebergs are coming. The question for us is in our businesses and as, as business advisors, what needs to happen for us to be ready? And I just want to put this in numbers, please, if you don't mind. 88% um, of the original Fortune 500 companies have disappeared over the last 60, uh, 60 years. Uh, it's predicted that 50% uh, of the current S&P, actually that number's down, I should change that slide, will actually be gone in the next six years, not 10 years. To bring this closer to home in South Africa, we have uh, 300 fewer companies listed on the JSE than we did 20 years ago. And when you go into the detail of some of this, you notice uh, in the data aspects of the Titanic syndrome, either arrogance, an excessive attachment to the past success, or an inability to recognize that there's a new and emerging uh, reality coming through. Uh, this number should scare you. Uh, if it doesn't, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> uh, but um, every couple of years, one of the big global consulting houses does a study. Uh, this is the latest number. Uh, 2020 from McKinsey, that 75% of our change efforts actually fail. So whether you're running a business or whether you are advising a business on changes to make, 75% of the stuff that we introduce does not yield the result that we're looking for. We don't extract the full value. Now that's significant. I mean, just you know, if you can think about what's the impact, what's the opportunity cost, the time, the labor, the energy. You know, if, you, if you're running uh, with staff and people, you know, how do you get them whipped up and excited about the next thing that's coming? And if you've been around in a business for a long time or an organization, that's why things start to sound familiar. You know, so, hey, uh, Bunny, here is uh, Project Accelerate. Let's get excited about this. And Bonnie will say, but uh, hey, Terence, you know, doesn't this sound very similar to Project Fast Forward from five years ago? We're having to repeat stuff because we're not extracting full value uh, from the changes uh, or the transformations that we're trying to bring. And when I talk transformation, yeah, I'm talking about policy, structure, process, systems, people, client experience, value chain, platform, you name it. 75% of our efforts actually don't give or yield the sustainable results. The big question is why? Why, oh why, is this the case? So here's a typical uh, business cycle. Every business goes through this cycle, startup growth maturity and into decline. And uh, typically what we are trying to do is as before uh, the current cycle goes into decline, we're trying to create a second curve. 
Yeah, Charles Handy in the 80s already was talking about what's your second curve. So if you look at businesses, for example, that, that grow through acquisition, very often they're creating a second curve, access to new market or access to new product or new technology. But this is a, is a typical, uh, represents the length of a business cycle. So listen to this one. In the past, uh, before the year 2000 uh, or mid 90s, the average length of a business cycle was 75 years. 75 years. Average length of a business cycle, 75 years. Round about the year 2000, there was a massive jump, massive jump to 15 years. Brought on by tech and a whole host of other things. Average length of a business cycle. What do you think that number is now? What's the average length of a business cycle right now? Put a comment in the chat for us, please. Put a comment in the chat for us, please. Five years, two years, three years, two years. Hoyala, Hoyala, thanks, Owen. Nine years, possibly five years. Dennis says at best three years, five years. Keep them coming, keep them coming. Keep them coming. By the way, folks, we can see uh, just on the system, the Titanic Syndrome Diagnostic has had 98 views, at, uh, 49 people have responded. Yeah. So uh, if you still want to complete that later on, it's open to you. You'll still get the result. Uh, I'm sure you'd want to know how you feature uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Okay, so lots of ranges coming in. Saskia, 12, um, five years, eight years. Okay, let me put you out of your misery. So, uh, and you're gonna get this information, by the way, you're gonna get this deck, so again, Here's another tool you could be using with your clients or in your business. Now, it varies here, you'll notice it varies by sector. Look at the jump from 2018 to 2020. Uh, we've just um, uh, pushed out the new survey for 2022. I'd love for you all to complete the survey. Uh, it takes a few minutes, uh, which basically answers this question, how often do we need to reinvent for our companies to survive? Um, but there are some companies, yes, that have to be uh, reinventing here, yeah, 16.1% every year or less. Just think about the speed of change here, every year or less. And there are some sectors, uh, 11 plus years. Uh, but here is the number that we are currently on. Six years. This is the number that we are currently on. Now just think for a minute about the speed of this. Think for a minute about the speed of this. The speed uh, of change here. And it always begs the question, are we ready? Are we ready for this? So for the advisors, I, I want you to think about, you know, what was advisory like in the long cycles? How did it work in the long cycles versus how does it work in the short cycles? By the way, when I say long and short, I'm talking about 75 and six. What was the leadership approaches that worked in, in the long cycles versus the short cycles? You know, um, customers, uh, by the way, um, let me just, scribble this. I wasn't planning to, but this well illustrates uh, the point that we're making. Uh, for those of you that are business owners here uh, in the call today, uh, if you think about the long cycles and how we took a product to market, um, it looked, I'm just scribbling here quickly, just give me a second. It looked something like this. Let me just take my blur screen off so I can show you. 
So in the long cycles, if we took a product or service to market, uh, we'd get some data, we'd uh, do some design on uh, a product, we'd build it, we'd implement it, and then we'll repeat the process. Which of these things do you think would take the most of our time in the long cycles, in the 75-year cycles? Where would we spend the bulk of our time? Where would we spend the, Nico says data. Can I hear some more? Design. Uh, thank you. We'd actually spend the bulk of our time in the build phase in the design, uh, sorry, in the, in the long cycles. And the build would typically look something like this. We spend a lot of time there. Why? Because we've got the time. In the long cycles, there's a lot of stability. There's not a lot of disruption. You know, we could spend our time perfecting the product, perfecting it. Now, the emphasis in the short cycles is on this concept called MVP. MVP, minimal viable product or solution. Minimal viable product or solution. So advisors, if you are not using the concepts of design thinking, design sprints, rapid prototyping, rapid testing, testing something before you try and perfect it. If you're not using that in your space, in your advisory work, you're dead. You're fraught. <laughs> you're going to get left behind. That's the reality. You know, but I, I really want you to pause on this diagram. This is also a tool you can use with your clients and a great conversation starter about what was needed to be successful in the long cycles versus what is needed to be successful in the short cycles right now. Uh, they're two very different orientations. Yeah. Um, let's hear from you in the chat. Uh, what were customers like in the long cycles versus the short cycles? And thanks, folks, for the contributions in the chat. Uh, that's fantastic. It lets me know that you're still here and you haven't rushed off to the quick spa or the pick and pay, uh, that you're still listening. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Winston. Um, do you want to just unmute and tell us a little bit more about that? What do you mean by loyal? So that's Winston Lawrence, please, uh, Christoph. The problem is Winston starts with a W, which is right at the bottom. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Winston. But we'll uh, that's fine. Are you, are you able to hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Now we can hear, hear you. Too. Go for it. Uh, thanks. Hi. Hi, Gary. I just joined a few minutes ago as well. No problem, Christoph. It's quite normal. I remember at school even, I was always at the bottom, <laughs> the last guy to speak in class. Uh, anyway, uh, what I mean is, uh, well, we know that um, loyalty is not something that people, are, that people have as much of as it's largely due to the uh, being disgruntled with, with what corporate does these days. So it's one of the main factors besides the speed at which things come to market as well. And, uh, and also with all the legislation we have in place, it's much easier for, it's much more difficult, for example, for EG Vodacom or the insurers to lock you into the products. Yeah, fantastic. So I think, thanks, Winston. So I think of loyalty people were very accepting in the long cycles. Now our, our clients are merciless. Why? Because they've got variety. They've got choice. If they're not getting value, they, they're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mongadi. Yeah, they had few options because there was relatively, you know, high barriers to entry, so not lots of competition. Uh, Daniela, um, thank you for joining us uh, all the way from uh, Germany. Uh, Daniela was the one that actually put uh, the survey together for you. Uh, do you want to comment on... on um, your comment there with the MVP, please. So that's uh, Daniela Joksimovic, uh, please, um, Christoph. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm working for a Swedish bank and uh, I'm a product owner within the IT, within the SAFE organization. And we talk about MVPs constantly and we have products lining up for delivery. And what I see is that these MVPs that should be smaller chunks of the product, like a basic, like a, let's call it a skateboard and then getting to a car, 
to go somewhere, um, they tend to make it too big. They keep adding features because of the past experience, actually, because we had the project, uh, the, the waterfall project before, and they are afraid that they will not have enough time after we build the MVP to deliver more features because the focus will be shifted. Yeah, spot on. So I think great observation, great comment. And Mongadi's uh, comment there about uh, being quicker with faster feedback with potential customers. So this whole, we're not going to go into design sprints and design thinking today. Yeah. Um, and, and thanks, Guy. Spot on. You've got to test your MVP in the real market. And so that's why with, with sprints and with prototyping, you actually bring your client into the sprint. Yeah, you bring the decision makers into the sprint, not take the product to them afterwards and then have to rehash. But it's good for us to reflect on, you know, what were, this, what were the practices as an advisor? What were the practices that made us successful in the long cycles? What's the new mindset and the new thinking and the new orientation that's required to thrive in the short cycles? To Guy's point earlier on, um, I thought I'd just share with you uh, uh, a tool called the Toto Matrix. We have the distinction here between failing today versus succeeding today, and then jeopardizing tomorrow versus thriving tomorrow. So remember the diagnostic that you completed? Uh, sorry, I just saw something else coming through in the chat. I got distracted there, Bonolo. Yeah, thank you, super, good, fantastic insight. Um, so here's the Titanic syndrome sitting over here. Now think about your score. Think about the email with the explanation of that Titanic syndrome. What is it? Well, it's when we, we only see the disaster when it hits us. <laughs> it's too late. Um, why? Because of overconfidence and arrogance, you know, heavy trust in the past successes or this inability to recognize that these things changing and shifting. Yeah. Consumer needs have shifted significantly pre-COVID versus post-COVID, um, affecting multiple industries. Now, if we are not tuned into that, we're going to be left behind. But if we, if we have Titanic syndrome present in our businesses, in our advisory practices, what's busy happening? We actually, we're failing today, but we're also killing tomorrow at the same time. We're jeopardizing tomorrow. And that's where that fits in on the matrix here. In the bottom right-hand quadrant, um, blind idealism, what are we doing there? There's lots of wishful thinking. Uh, we're so focused on you know, strategy, uh, heavy focus on strategy, but there's a bias towards implementation and action. We're so focused on the big picture and the dream, but we actually disconnected from the reality. And so here we are, we are sorting out tomorrow, but we're jeopardizing or failing today. In the top left-hand quadrant, we have firefighting, which is where we find in our practices, in our business, many of our, our clients, all focused on the short term, sorting out the crisis, going from one crisis to the next. The challenge is, is that if the business is always in crisis mode, it leads to literal chronic exhaustion. But there's this bias against anticipation and reflection. You know, we're happy being busy. We are stuck and we're broken at the end of the week. We are solving for today, but we're not necessarily putting the building blocks in place to thrive tomorrow. And of course, the top right-hand quadrant, the plus plus, is finding that, that balance, that polarity, that dance between what do I need to do to survive today, but at the same time, make sure I'm putting in the building blocks to make sure that I can thrive tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah, when we're in the reinvention space, we start seeing change as an opportunity, as a plus, not as a drain, a pain, and a strain, not as something that's going to take away from us, but rather something that's going to add to. So final uh, comment from you, please, in the chat. Um, we could annotate this on the screen, but it's probably better if you just put it in the chat. 
Where do you think your business is now? Or where do you think you are as, a, as an advisor? Uh, in which one of those quadrants? And you may be in a combination of them, you know. Um, I guess uh, firefighting, Titanic, blind idealism, we all visit all of those quadrants from time to time. My question is, where do you live currently? If you look at those descriptors, um, remember Titanic syndrome, your score would have given you an indication of the extent to which Titanic syndrome is alive and well in your business, in your practice. But if you look at this diagram, where do you think you spend most of your time? Which quadrant? And pop a comment into the chat for us, please. Thanks a bit of honesty, eh? Thank you, Enrico. And so my, my question to you is, you know, the challenge there is how do you sustain that? Thank you, Luther. Um, thank you, Terence. Yeah firefighting and blind idealism uh, that's okay you know it's 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 so uh, there's a reality of straddling we could be straddling you know more than one thank you mongadi uh firefighting uh mongadi can we can we unmute you quickly uh terence if you don't uh, uh terence uh christoph if you don't mind mongadi lecheza um can i may i ask you what is that firefighting creating for you at the moment Is it Mongani that you? Uh, Mongadi. Mongadi, sorry. I... Monga, M O N G A D I. I've got Mongadi, yes. Mongadi can talk. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go for it. All right, no, thanks, man. Um, yo, it is <laughs> day, uh, like you said, you know, a business which, you know, is always. Uh, fighting uh, uh, challenges uh, is basically running out of strength, you know, with reaching exhaustion. So managing the circumstances now, I mean, we we had to let go some some two people. But um, I think at the moment, um, uh, uh, but but I'm hopeful. <laughs> I'm 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 optimistic. I, I come at me, I will not lose my optimistic. I refuse. So that's where I am now. I, 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 I'm, I'm refusing to let go of my optimism. The, the, and we don't want you to let go of that. But I, I love what you said there, you know, about the, it's exhaustion, it's burnout, it's because it's not sustainable. Yes. You know, um, uh, Rick, uh, would you mind unmuting and just expand on your comment, please, if you don't mind? Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing because uh, you're forever telling your clients uh, what they ought to be doing, and you're not always living um, the, the the advice that you're giving. So I'd like to believe that um, that I've got wishful thinking, but I, I'm probably uh, sorry, I, I'd like to believe that I'm actually reinventing and pivoting and all that good stuff. And I give people lots of advice about MVPs. Uh, but if I look back and I'm honest, uh, I'm probably not implementing those myself. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, I, I'm, I, I'm with you. Yeah, I, I work largely in the advisory consulting and coaching community. Uh, and I think we all champion a lot of stuff with our clients that we don't necessarily live ourselves. <laughs> I've regularly got to ask myself that question with my own coach. Um, but yeah, so the question is, uh, the point is, wherever you find yourself on this grid, yeah, um, it's okay. Because it's just a snapshot at a point in time. It's not the movie, yeah. It's not the movie. The encouraging thing is that there's something you can do to create the shift. And the something you can do to create the shift, we've actually given you 15 answers, 15 ideas that's in the diagnostic that you answered. Because each of those statements is uh, an idea on something you could be doing differently to either anticipate change, to see what's coming, 
to design change uh, or solutions to that change and then implement. The diagnostic itself uh, is, is an answer. Yeah. So thank you for your honesty. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I think as, as I start to wrap up, uh, I want to mention, you know, th this uh, playing in this quadrant, this top right hand quadrant, which is where the energy is. I think of what happens in the other three quadrants, especially Titanic syndrome um, and also firefighting. Uh, those tend to be energy sapping the energy draining. Uh, the top right hand quadrant is where the life is. And that's the whole purpose of reinvention. Um, and we are helping clients to reinvent themselves, uh, their value chains, their client experience, their business, their profitability, their revenue, their market share. The ultimate, the ultimate aim of reinvention is to, is to increase the level of life in that business, whichever way they measure that. Yeah. But that's not something that um, that happens on its own. It's not going to happen by default. Uh, and if I can, if I can link just one more time to these cycles, in the long cycles, we waited for the solution to come. Uh, we waited for somebody to tell us what to do. In the short cycles, there's there's no savior coming. We've got to figure that out for ourselves. But the short cycles also require a massive amount of collaboration. Um, uh, Christoph alluded to this in the, in the introduction, you know, in the long cycles, you could know a lot. You could even know everything. Um, you could be the guru. Now, uh, you know, anybody that tells me they know everything on a particular subject matter, I, I, they're talking nonsense, they're lying. It's impossible because the body of knowledge and so many things are shifting so rapidly that we don't, we need this dependency on other people to bring additional pieces of knowledge. Uh, I think of from a practical point of view in running a business, you know, um, am I going to, if there's a particular skill set that I need in the business, am I going to spend time developing the skill set? Or am I actually better off buying that skill set in uh, and bringing that skill set into the business? Because I don't have the time uh, to go and develop the skill set. I'd rather buy it in. Yeah. Uh, Terence, you asked the question about is that number of years for the, that's the full cycle. That's the full cycle, six years. Yeah. That's the number that we are on currently. So the implication of that is that you and I have to be re to stay relevant. You and I have to be reinventing ourselves every three to four years or so. If we're not, uh, we stagnate. We get fraught. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues says it's like taking a shower. You know, if you don't take a shower regularly, you start to stink. Um, and so we've got to follow the same process and principle uh, in our business. Much of what I've spoken about is available for you in a free 85 page download. Um, we'll put this in the deck. Um, so you can go and download this. Uh, and then there's an additional free tool. We won't have time to spend on it today, um, but the, the explanation is self-explanatory. Yeah, and we'll pop those, uh, those links will be on the deck uh, as well. So my name is Gary Graham. Thanks for having me today. Uh, I'm open to take a few questions, but other than that, flat, flat, my story is eight. Uh, no, Gary, not so quickly, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. If your head is a bit spinning a bit, it's understandable because uh, for some of us um, that have uh, created a way of working with clients specifically around our area of expertise, you know, sort of so maybe that I'm focusing more on accounting or I'm focusing more on business processes and production, or I may be focusing on marketing and helping my clients to be out in the market. We, we may very much be uh, using those tools that we're so accustomed to and comfortable with. So if you are in that space where the, where the discomfort is, um, then there's definitely a framework here for us to firstly understand ourselves. And then if we are supporting others, other businesses to provide that to our businesses. Thank you very much, Gary, for offering us that insight. And uh, there's nothing more vivid than seeing the Titanic. So um, 
as a reminder to um, let me just say if you have questions that you want us to address it's best to click the q a button the q a button and put it there because the text chat has kind of evolved quite a bit so if you've put a question in the text chat before and you really want us to answer it please put it into the into the q a and then we know we can address that um, we've shared some of the links there uh, Gary, those resources, I'll, I'll start off those resources that you mentioned, those you'll be sending off to the people that completed the Titanic survey. So, so I, I'll put this in the in the deck, the present, the, in the presentation deck. So let me just run through them. I posted a link at 1238. That is, that is your copy. Um, it's a free 85 page review of this book called uh, the Titanic uh, the Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook, okay, this one. And quite a few of the concepts and the tools that we've spoken about is in there. So that's your free download. You can go and register and download that immediately. The second link is the free business model reinvention cards. There's 25 of them. Uh, that may trigger for you uh, some additional you know, you'll see what models are you using in your business right now? What could you potentially uh, add from a business model or revenue generation point of view? You can also use that uh, with clients. Uh, and then the last link, uh, the Google Doc is the survey. It's the new survey on uh, how often we need to be reinventing. Um, if you complete it, uh, Christoph, Terence, uh, Bonnie, et cetera, you, it's up to you. I'm happy to come back at some point and share the results with you. you, you you'll be interested to know what's happening in South Africa, but also what's happening in the world with how, how it, is that six year cycle getting shorter? Or is it getting longer? And what are some of the other things that are that are coming up? Yeah. Um, but I'll share all of that in the pack. Uh, it's all in the pack as well. But if people wanted the links now, yeah. um, it's in so the, the links are there in the text chat so that's the advantage of coming to the live event as opposed to waiting for the recording is you get all those links uh, sent uh, through the text chat click on them now because when the meeting is over you will not have access to them again and thank you very much for your generosity in sharing uh, uh Gary. that's much appreciated in creating the tool set, uh, offering us access to and then giving us reference to those tool sets i don't see any questions popping up in the Q&A, but you can also raise your hand if you want to rather talk to a question or a comment that you want to make in terms of how this may apply to you. We want to make it engaging and we might want to make the learning experience solid. So you can raise your hand on the bottom bar of your Zoom window. You can raise your hand, we'll see it raising, or you can click the Q&A and post your question there in Q&A and we will answer that. Mm -hmm. um, while we while we at that point, uh, Terence, I wonder if I can just bring you in here for a moment. Thank you very much, Terence, for uh, recommending that we bring Gary in uh, to this event. Um, uh, so you you've gone through this uh, reinvention, learning about reinvention, Terence, and applying it a bit too. You know, sort of. What stands out for you? Uh, so some of us are new to it, but you've you've been exposed to it a bit more. What stands out for you as a powerful element of it in the work that you do with smaller businesses? So as I indicated in the chat, I'm sort of straddled in two um, quadrants and not quite in reinvention yet. So <clears throat> though I've been to the lab a couple of times and hearing Gary speak again, it just um, emphasizes all those really good points again. Um, I have made use of it in general, but what I find very interesting is, is the awareness of the importance of doing something quickly. Um, we, we, we tend to say this, there's tomorrow. Tomorrow is another day and we, we, we've got tomorrow. Uh, the MVP um, concept is, is, is a key part of that. Is if you don't look to see the things that are happening around you and use that information, to make good business decisions, you are going to um, slide down the body. That cycle always goes down and you're going to slide down that scale. And, and that's the important part. Gary didn't say it today, but effectively, if I remember correctly, what Nadia was saying is that about 85% of people who don't reinvent before they reach the peak don't make it at all. Uh, and that's quite scary. So the, the application of that is about keeping your ears open, listening, 
and I think that's quite a key, is listening to what's happening around you and your staff and your clients and using that information to make good decisions for reinvention. Yeah, so you're referring to Nadia, and I'll try to pronounce her name, but I'll fail, but I'll try, uh, because it's Kazakhstanian. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can say it, Gary, rather than me. Zetumbayeva. <laughs> yeah, Zetumbayeva. So Nadia is the driving force. So you'll also see the blog post that we did pre the webinar on her work, you know, sort of leading into reinvention. And uh, there's a lot of that stuff that um, is what Gary is referring to, too. Uh, so there's a bit of international movement here, Gary. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. I, think, um, I mean, you've heard Daniela's voice. Uh, uh, you've heard um, Phil is on the call. I think that the in uh, across Africa, the practitioner number of certified reinvention practitioners, we're probably sitting uh, at about uh, 15 at the moment. The goal is to grow it to about 40 or 50 uh, within the next 12 months. But the global group, you know, our, our, our goal is to reach a billion people with basic reinvention tools. We think the world uh, needs it. We think businesses need it, communities need it. Um, we are way past the stage of being attached to IP that comes out of the long cycles. So you'll notice most of the stuff that we share is free. We want people to use it. Uh, it's accessible. Um, it's functional. And the lab that Terence is talking about, uh, if I may Chris, uh, offer Christo, there's actually a new lab starting next week. It's a, we call it a five-day easy reinvention lab. Uh, each day, you'll get a new tool. Uh, out of the lab, a tool that you can go and apply almost immediately. It's five days, but it's it's an hour a day. It's one hour a day, and I'll I'll pop the link here to the Easy Reinvention Lab, or if Christoph's got it, there, oh, there he's got it. Thank you, Christoph. There's the Easy Reinvent. You can register. Uh, you'll have access to the live recordings. You'll uh, join a global community, a global movement uh, of people um, wanting to amplify, reach, impact, and influence wanting to turn disruption into an opportunity. So uh, yeah, it's free. Uh, come and join us. Um, Terence has got tremendous value out of it. Uh, he can't stop talking. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome to join us. The, uh, the challenge, Christoph, is in a session like this, we can't go deep. <laughs> uh, and so at least in the lab, there's an opportunity just to expand on the concepts and the thinking, the data, the science, the research a little bit. Yeah. And it's a network. You connect with people from across the world who are thinking in a similar way to you because they're showing up in the same space. So uh, no need for us to get into our cars and drive to a venue to connect with others. We can now switch on our phones or our laptops and uh, across the world. So that's quite powerful too, of course. Okay, so um, Gary, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna thank you really at the end. But um, there's one hand up, um, which um, is your lady T, not the T, not the lady, lady T. Uh, so you can speak, lady T. Can you speak? Well, I thought I allow you. Let's see again. Let's try again. You can talk now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph, uh, um, Gary, and the rest of the colleagues for your contribution. So, Gary, with regards to the lab, you say um, it is over five days. I am reinventing myself in that I have fired my employer because my physical and mental health was highly compromised after five years. It was a, a, an amazing um, go though, but I had to, to, to choose me first, you know? So my interest in going into consulting, would you advise that to just lab is an appropriate platform to it? Oh, uh, abs absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'd encourage you to just click on the link uh, you'll actually see the content of, uh, of the lab for each day, uh, nicely outlined. Um, besides Nadia, you'll get access to a couple of additional guest speakers, uh, I think on most of the, the evenings. Uh, but for sure, you're going to work away, a walk away. With
use um, in your own consultancy. Otherwise, uh, uh, we wouldn't recommend it. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, Derek, I'm not sure. I see Derek, the uh, MD of Ibasa, is in the room too now. If you are able to show your face, or did we lose you now? You were here just now. Uh, sorry, Derek has disappeared. So, Jefferson of Ibasa, um, there are lots of people in the room who are in the practice of supporting entrepreneurs. Why should they uh, join Ibasa? Um, I've not forgotten about saying thank you to Gary because it's such an important task that we'll leave till the last, but, <laughs> or, or, or if you need to run, I'll say thank you now, or can you stay for a moment longer? Hi, right, Christoph. Oh, there's Derek. So you're gonna speak, Derek? My, yes, my, I'm you, here. You, I'm you, can here. Sing, I'm you can here. sing in a duet if you if you want to. My question, Derek, <laughs> is why 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 should I, as a practitioner, if I'm not a member of it, pass I yet join the organization and how? But Christoph, after today's presentation, I think everybody should understand that it's about uh, <laughs> reinventing and uh, making sure that there is a growth in business, but also being the member of IPAS, I think that would be one of the enablers for one to have some kind of a recognition in terms of prof, uh, profession and in, in their practices. So um, I think today um, everybody would have had an eye opener to say, how do we position our businesses better for us to, to leverage in terms of client base and, 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 and growth. So um, being a member of a professional body, I think it's, it's one way of getting that recognition, but also getting that credibility in the industry. So if you wanna be the member of IPASA, um, anytime you are welcome uh, to send us the email, uh, we will send you all the information with regard to the membership. I think uh, Christoph has shared that on, on the platform. And yeah, we, we, we have improved in terms of our communication, I must say. We, we, we have beefed up our staff because we, we would have a lot of inquiries, but now we are able to attend to most of the inquiries. And, 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 and thank you very much for being patient with us, but we, we, we have improved a lot and we do encourage anyone to want to call us and to send us emails. We'll be able to, to respond and come back to you uh, within a reasonable time. And yeah, we're looking forward to having uh, more members and growth and also to more of these webinars because they've been impactful and they are impactful and we see growth in terms of our businesses and the growth in terms of our practices. Thank you very much, Christoph. Great, thank you very much. There's something more I'll share just now, but I'm first gonna allow Sida a moment if uh, Bongi, Bonnie, if there's any news from your side or anything to share or any observations around today's uh, topic that we covered that you would like to uh, bring our attention to, you're free to do so. Um, thank you, uh, Christopher. Um, uh, from CEDA's side, we, we're just happy that um, we had this very, very insightful presentation from Gary. Um, who only not shared, you know, the information and, and his experiences and the knowledge, but he also empowered us with the tools and even the material that we can be able to utilize at our respective practices. Um, for those who are working for CEDA, just like myself, I think we can take, you know, what we have learned here and, and uh, assist in terms of uh, putting CEDA at a, a different level. We can contribute you know, to make CEDA a better uh, place or a better organization uh, to work for. Thank you. Great stuff. And then of course, uh, the third uh, partner in bringing you these webinars is the Entrepreneurial Planning Institute, which I'm from. Uh, my colleague and normal host, Tobeka Poz, was unfortunately not able to be here today, but she wanted to be here, but it wasn't possible. Um, I've got some, some things to share with you just now, but before we step off the topic, uh, some exciting things, so don't go away. Um, 
Uh, Gary, uh, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, this was uh, really powerful and thank you for your enthusiasm and energy and insights and tools. And uh, we thought it was done, but then you also had some more to deliver and provide us with access to go and read and, and use more. So thank you very much for what you offered us today.